have the orphan trains. John Schantz lives in Helena. He's a retired attorney and a uh, previous member of the House of Representatives. He's a Democrat. <laughs> um, he's authored two books, Montana Freedom of Information Handbook and The Milwaukee Road in World War II. I've asked if we can get that program here. So I think that would be fun. Um, Thank you. He says he's currently cat herder and water boy on the forthcoming book about Taft, America's Wicked City, and the construction of the St. Paul Tunnel, today's Hiawatha Trail. I think that might be another one. Then he has magazine articles on Milwaukee Road silk trains and the Moulton, Washington, the life of a railroad town. So like, okay, two more. <laughs> We're interested, right? Okay. So, John, it's all yours. Thank you. Good evening. Um, by the way, the silk trains were the fastest trains ever to go through Missoula on the Milwaukee Road. Period. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. You got a handout. Okay, there are several things in there. One is. Um, an article that came out last spring in Distinctly Montana, which is a very nice magazine, about orphan trains in Montana. And the reason I wanted to give it to you is because there is uh, an obituary in there about one man who came to Montana as an orphan train and was a successful rancher, et cetera, et cetera. Also is uh, sort of the cover flyer about what we do um, project making a difference, and there is also a Northern Pacific timetable in there from 1967 that features Missoula. So I'm with the Upper Musselshell Historic Society in Harleton, and in 2014-13, we started this project um, called Project Making a Difference. There were a lot of people who were writing stories, novels television programs, films about the orphan train saga, which is what I like to call it, but they had the railroad stuff just all wrong. <laughs> so we decided to get involved and help straighten up the mess. Um, primarily what we do, we do, we do a couple, three things. We do programs like this across the United States. We, um, for individual children, 1853 to 1929, we we're able with a bit of information to plot their actual trip from New York City to Tudot or Boise or Baton Rouge, wherever. And that was the primary thrust of what we do. There are some sample letters on the table back there if you're interested in our, that part of our mission. The other thing we do is we, we do work with novelists magazine article writers, um, television and film producers, directors, stage producers and directors that do articles, books, fiction and nonfiction, um, in uh, film and television programs on the Orphan Train story. Uh, we consult uh, with them and work to make sure that the railroad part of what they're doing is historically accurate. Um, and on the table back there, by the way, there is several copies of probably the best non-fiction book written about this whole saga. Um, and they're not ours, but the gal that wrote the book, Renee Wendinger, her mother was an orphan train writer, <coughs> writer. And in fact, her mom's trip was the first one that we did from New York to a little town in Minnesota uh, in 2014. We've done hundreds and hundreds of them since then. Since then. <coughs> Excuse me. I forgot to bring my water bottle. So, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm missing. Next slide, please. One of the things that's really, really important about this whole story, and we all need to keep in mind is, don't judge the past by today's standards. The story, the Orphan Train Saga is not a happy story necessarily, but in its day, 
it was considered the absolute Christian thing to do, to sweep these children off the streets of New York, Boston, Chicago, primarily, but primarily New York, ship them off to farms and homes in small town America, rather than let them die of hypothermia on the streets of New York. Um, this whole movement was based in Christian theology. Today we would find what you're going to see pretty offensive, but you've got to remember this started in 1853. In those days there were no public and very few private social service agencies that existed. Uh, the other thing that's really important to understand about this whole story is in the year 1900, there was a total of 120 paved miles of highway in the United States. So if you put all that together, I could get from Helena to Missoula, but I couldn't get back. Uh, and th this is really important because the way Americans lived up until actually the beginning of World War II is very different than how we live today. Uh, like, for example, it says Montana 2017. In 2017 in Montana, we had almost 74,000 miles of road um, and over almost 13,000 miles of paved highway versus in 1900, 120. Next slide, please. So, the streets of New York were very inhospitable to children. And these are <clears throat> very typical of the kids that lived on the streets of New York City um, in, say, 1890. Next slide, please. Were they immigrants? Um, many of them were. What they were were children that lived primarily in the slums um, whose parent, one had died, or the, and the other abandoned them, or whatever. But it was a mixture. They weren't all immigrants. Um, it is the largest migration of just children in the history of the world, bar none, that happened in this country. Um, and the numbers vary a little bit, but primarily the best guess is there were about a third of a million kids that were shipped from New York City to farms and small towns all across North, uh, the United States. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the first trip literally was in 1854, and these children rode with a, an adult, there were 12 of them, on a steamboat from New York City to Albany, New York. From Albany, New York to Buffalo, they rode on an immigrant car, which was a box car with benches nailed to the floor. At, at to Buffalo, they got on a steamer and rode the Great Lakes to Detroit. And then in Detroit, they got on another train and went about 100 miles to a small town, and that's where they were taken in. Next slide, please. So this is a map from 1853 to 1929, but this is dated 1910. This is from one agency in New York City, just one, uh, and it shows where they sent children. And if you look prior to 1910, there were 83 of these kids that came to Montana. After 1910, it was, there was a flood that came to Montana of these children, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide, please. Um, so these kids have been taken off the streets in New York, they have been bathed, fed for two days, new clothes, put on a train west to where they did not know. Next slide, please. This whole program started in England in the 1830s. And if we think about British history, the Brits were always very good about sending their problems overseas, <laughs> right? Criminals to Australia, religious dissidents to America. Well, <clears throat> in about 20 years, 100,000 st uh, street children were swept off the streets of London and Liverpool um, 
Most of them were sent by boat and rail to new homes in Canada, Australia, and South Africa, South Africa being the first uh, country that received them, and they were all boys, anywhere from six to 12 years old, and they were sent as farm laborers. That was what started this program. Um, the program, by the way, from Britain ended in 1953. The last child was sent to British Columbia and Canada in 1953. Next slide, please. So here's a group, probably about 1925, at a London train station, and these boys are off for South Africa. And they were indentured to work until they were 21 years old. And girls were indentured to work until they were 18. Next slide, please. So this is one of the iconic photographs from about 1880 of three orphan train children in New York City. The girl on your right has been out on the streets for a while. You can tell by the look on her face. The other girl has not been out on the streets very long because she still has a smile. The boy in the middle is, as an orphan, living in the streets of New York, a very privileged young man because he, unlike the girls, is wearing shoes. So most of, these, most of the boys ended up selling newspapers. That was uh, their in industry. The girls, they sang songs, they sold flowers, and most of them, starting at about the age of 10, became prostitutes. And that's how they survived uh, uh, until they either died in the winter or of influenza or whatever. Next slide, please. This whole thing was started by a guy named Charles Loring Brace. Uh, he graduated with a degree in theology from Yale University. And as a present, his father sent him to England for a month. And there he saw what the Brits were doing, the police in London and Liverpool were doing with the waifs living on the street. As a consequence, he decided to make this his life mission and founded the Children's Aid Society. Because at, in the, that day, there were, on the streets of New York, more people, more children, abandoned children, than live in Missoula today. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of Reverend Brace. And by the way, he lived a long life. He died in the late 1890s. So he was able to see what uh, his work produced. Next slide, please. So yeah, it's about the same as Helena. This is a conservative number. Um, the actual number is probably closer to 38,000 of just abandoned children living in the streets of primarily Manhattan. Next slide, please. So these kids, initially, through the Children's Aid Society, were taken in as young as two years old. Girls generally were two plus, boys generally were three plus, and if you think about that age, there's a reason. The Children's Aid Society was not an orphanage. It didn't keep kids for years. It, they were brought to the agency. They were cleaned up, fed, bathed, slept in a bed two nights, and shipped west. Well, one of the things about railroads until literally World War II was the, the uh, bathroom facilities were pretty primitive. So a lot of railroads would not allow small children on long distance trains because there was no way to deal with diapers, dirty diapers. The bathrooms were just a little cubby hole and a coach with a hole in the seat that dumped human waste onto the tracks. And that's why railroads uh, for many, many, many years, as a train came into the station, the conductor or trainman would lock the bathroom door. Otherwise, waste had a tendency to build up in front of the depot. So the Children's Aid Society did not send 
kids west on trains until they were potty trained. And when they were sent west, next slide please, oops, um, they uh, carried with them a small cardboard suitcase. They all were given a new suit of clothes or a new dress the morning they left New York and a new pair of shoes. And one small cardboard suitcase that carried a second new set of clothes or a new dress, but not new shoes. They were not allowed to bring anything else with them. No personal mementos, no toys, no dolls, no pictures, no handkerchiefs, nothing. Because they were sent west to begin a brand new life on a farm or a small town. And a lot of these kids, um, as they grew older, refused to talk about their trip, their experience, their early life, if they remembered it. Uh, much like combat veterans particularly don't talk about their experience. Um, so many of these children that moved out west had sons and daughters, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Their families know really very little, if anything, about where these kids came from or who their families were or anything. Um, and we, we work with the families to kind of fill in that gap. When you use the word adopted, you use the word orphan, but not the word adopted. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Okay. Um, so these kids in Manhattan particularly, they, they lived and slept and died on the streets. This is a fairly typical example of um, spending the night somewhere. This is in a uh, basement entrance to a tenement house in Manhattan. Next slide, please. And this is what they look like. These five or six boys have been brought to the Children's Aid Society. The building is in the background. They've been cleaned up, haircut, bathed, new, new suits, and they're ready to go west. Next slide, please. This is very important because this is the entire motivation behind the, the program over the decades. They were, kids were supposed to be sent to clean, wholesome, Protestant, Protestant farm and small town homes in the Midwest away from the evils of the big city. And the agencies that did this over the years were very, very faithful to that mission. So what did that mean? Well, one thing that meant was there were very, very few of these children that would have come to Missoula or Helena or Billings or Great Falls, much less Butte, because they were big cities. Um, Stevensville, yes. Townsend, yes. Harleton, yes. Small towns. And like I say, the first boat of kids left New York in November of 1853. The other thing that's important here is, particularly into the deep south and the southwest, um, most of these children didn't travel by railroad at all. They traveled by intercoastal steamship, and then uh, for many years through the Great Lakes on Great Lakes steamships um, as well. And, okay, next slide please. So here is a group of children eating at the Children's Aid Society facility in New York. And within 48 hours at best, all these kids will be gone from New York. Next slide, please. In 1868, the Archbishop of the Catholic Diocese of New York got very concerned talking about the immigrant issue because the Children's Aid Society was a very firm Protestant agency. And the Archbishop found out that the Children's Aid Society were sending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Catholic immigrant children to Protestant homes. And that did not wash well. <laughs> so he convinced the Sisters of Charity, three nuns, to start the New York Foundling Hospital to send children west. The New York Foundling Hospital still exists, as does the Children's Aid Society. They are the two largest children's social service agencies in New York City today. 
Uh, and they all have, they both have all their old records, by the way. Um, the New York Founding Hospital, though, uh, one of their hallmarks of the day, and I believe still is, is every night, 365 nights a year, there are two bassinets put outside the front door. Anyone can, can uh, drop a baby off in the bassinet and, and leave it, and no questions asked. The bassinets are checked every three to five minutes, around the clock. Um, the New York Foundling Hospital then would take infants and keep them for two and a half or three and a half years until they were potty trained in a facility in New York City and then send them west. One of the tales of this experience was there was an Irish immigrant mother who had a daughter, infant daughter, who was quite ill. She took her daughter to the New York Foundling Hospital for treatment on Tuesday. And she went back on Friday to see how her, her daughter was doing, and the nuns denied that the child had ever been there. Well, the child had been set west on a train on Thursday. A lot of that happened. Next slide, please. So here is a nursery at the New York Foundling Hospital. You see the nun. You see all the kids, and back in those days, you know, if you, until you were potty trained as a boy, you generally wore a dress because it was easier to change a diaper than pulling down pants. So it's hard to tell which are the boys and which are the girls in this photograph. Next slide, please. Particularly, the New York Foundling Hospital, on occasion, would send an entire carload of children west, and it's not as bleak as it sounds. But the point here is, it's very important. Even today, most people that contact us say, well, did my grandmother arrive in Bonner on the orphan train? Well, there never was any such thing as an orphan train or a train load of orphans that went anywhere in this country. All of these children, and they traveled in groups of six up to about 70, with accompanying adults, they were never just put on the train and sent somewhere. Um, they all rode on regularly scheduled passenger trains. Like Amtrak does today, a car load like this, the car would be attached to the back of a regularly scheduled passenger train. So if you've ever ridden Amtrak, particularly in the summer in Montana, at the back of the train there are usually two or three private cars attached to the train. And that's how this happened. But it's important to remember all these kids rode on regularly scheduled passenger trains. One of the myths of the orphan train saga. Okay, next slide, please. So how did all this w actually work? Next slide, please. This young lady's name is Alice. Alice went from New York City to a little town outside of Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1887. And one of the rules of the road here, by the way, was when these children arrived in their new town at their, quote, new homes, they had, the new parents were required to get a photograph taken of them that day. So we have lots of these kinds of photographs. Um, next slide, please. Now, the two sending agencies, the Children's Aid Society and the New York Foundling Hospital, did things very, very differently. And it's important as the story rolls along here to keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Children's Aid Society, Protestant families only. Loaded a car with as many as 30 kids or sent groups as small as six kids. If there were six children, there was an agent. That was the person who was called an agent that traveled with the children. If there were as many as 70, there would be um, probably three, maybe four adults that accompanied the trip. The other thing that's interesting, as we've worked on this over the years, is almost all of the children left New York City on Monday or Tuesday on trains. Wherever they went in the country, that was the rule. And the reason it was the rule was so that, in the case of the Children's Aid Society, the agents could deliver the children and get back to New York City for church services the following Sunday morning. On occasion, the Children's Aid Society would send out, particularly in Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri, 
they had people that either volunteered or were on their staff that would go to small towns, put up posters, talk to the local ministers, and um, put a piece in the paper that on June 23rd, 1903, at 3.10 p.m., there would be orphans coming from New York available to take in. And so all this was announced through the community um, before the kids got there. In many cases, like in Montana, there would be a communication with a, um, a, a group of ministers along a branch line. Always a branch line, almost never on a main line. Um, next slide, please. So this kind of describes what they did. Um, quite often they would try to establish kind of a local steering committee. Um, and if you want to learn more about the Children's Aid Society, you can just go into your browser, type in Children's Aid Society, you'll find a lot of history about how they operate. And of course, as time passed along, this started in 1853, ended in 1929, as time passed along, the record keeping was better. Um, the accompanying adults were better, but it was still where these children ended up with the Children's Aid Society was to put it mildly a crapshoot. Next slide, please. Most of these kids were sent by rail from New York City to either Chicago or St. Louis. Then they were transferred to a Western Railroad and there was a, they would, the Children's Aid Society would pick out a branch line, say a branch line of small towns where there were maybe five or six towns along the branch line. And that's where they would do their advertising and promotion and say these kids are coming. Next slide, please. So the other thing about America prior to World War I was how we used language very different than the way we use language today. This is a broadsheet um, that was posted. I um, can't see the name of the town as you think it is. At any rate, it says, Troy, Troy, Missouri. Wanted, homes for children. Be in Troy. The kids will arrive on fe Friday, February 25th, 1910. And it goes on to talk about who uh, is sponsoring this is be at the opera house on Friday at 1.30 p.m. Well, an opera house, every little town had one was the movie theater of today. Next slide, please. Um, this is from a newspaper ad in Valley Falls, Kansas. These children are bright, intelligent, and well-disciplined, both boys and girls of vigorous age, various ages. They are placed on trial. And if not satisfactory, will be removed. Um, next slide, please. So this one is another broadsheet. Um, this is from the Children's Home Society, which is in Chicago. It still exists today. It's a very large children's service agency. They absolutely refuse to cooperate with anyone having anything to do with the orphan train movement. They do have their old records, but they will not share them even with the families of these children, or descendants of these children. I think the next slide, please. Next. So here's some language from there. All children received under the care of this association are of special promise in, in intelligence and health, are in age from one month to 12 years, and are sent free to those receiving them on 90 days free trial unless a special contract is otherwise made. Next slide, please. So what happened with the Children's Aid Society right up until the end was the train would pull into the station. And it's really important here to remember that for railroads, this was difficult. Because one of the things that railroads were absolutely required to do with passenger trains were to keep the trains on time. That was more important than anything. It had nothing to do with passengers at all. It had to do with the fact that all mail moved by rail. 
So if a train was laid even off a branch line, it could, that, it could literally ripple across the U.S. postal system across the country. So trains were on time. This was an exception. So the kids were lined up on a platform or at the local opera house. Uh, townspeople and farmers inspected these kids and made their selections. Next slide, please. This is a group of Children's Aid Society children lined up on a railroad depot platform waiting for inspection. So out of this group, let's say four of them were taken. The others would get back on the train, go down five or ten miles to the next town in the branch line, repeat, repeat, repeat. If there were any children left over, they were taken back to New York, put back into a group, and were gone from New York City in 48 hours again. Very poor record keeping. So the Children's Aid Society today, they know when these kids left. Um, they know the town they arrived in, but 80% of the time they have no idea who got them. It just and there was never any follow-up. There were no social workers or none of that happened until probably about 1925. Next slide, please. And that's how the process worked with the Children's Aid Society. It was uh, not something we would consider human to do today, but like I say, we can't judge what people, were, Americans were doing in 1880 by our own standards, other than to note that hopefully, as a society, we have made some progress. Next slide, please. Were brothers, brothers and sisters separated? All the time. Yeah, Question right. was, were brothers and sisters separated? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, well, the New York Foundling Hospital did something very different because they had a hierarchy across the country, even in places that were not states or even territories because they had diet, Catholic dioceses with the bishop uh, in parishes. So what happened, what happened here, um, the Children's Aid Society would send a telegram to the bishop of Western Montana saying, we have children available. The bishop would send out a notice to all the parishes. The priests would make an announcement from the pulpit that says, if you want a child, if you're interested, see me after church. And then people that were interested were given a form to fill out. Uh, and, then, and then they would place an order for a child. Next slide, please. This is a group of New York foundling children. And again, you notice they're all older. They're all potty trained. Um, and there are both nuns and nurses in the photograph. Next slide, please. Bob, 1890. So what would be ordered? Well, I want a blue-eyed girl. I want red hair. She has to have a clear mind, at least 10 years old, and she has to be able to work. That was the order. And the nuns in New York would fill the order as best they could and then send the child west. Next slide, please. So this girl is probably about eight, nine years old. This is the photograph of the day that she arrived, wherever she arrived. It was in the Midwest. And if you look at this photograph, you'll notice she's not holding a doll. She's holding a broom. And she was taken by a family who wanted a maid. And that's what she did. Next slide, please. You asked about adoption. This is really important because up until quite literally after World War II, particularly in rural America, adoption was just not done. Um, prior to World War I, many states had no legal method to create a legal adoption. These kids generally, unless they were older, took the surname or the last name of the family that took them in. But there was never any legal work done. Um, there are no adoption records for them. Um, <clears throat> because adoption, like I say, was considered unnecessary, uh, cost a lot of money where it was available. And most importantly, 
the parents, the new parents, did not want these children to inherit their property because they were not blood children. So they, re they refused to adopt them. They didn't adopt them. They, many were given loving homes. Most were not, but many were, um, as we'll see. Oops. But they were just simply not adopted. Next slide, please. So the New York Foundling Hospital, which was called an asylum, asylum back in the day meant a hospital. Uh, not doesn't mean today what it meant in 1910 at all. Um, the New York Foundling Hospital required every new family to sign a, an indenture. It's a three-page document. This is what the first page looks like. And the child was subject to that indenture, that, and it's a work indenture, until the girls were 18 or the boys were 21, even if they were two years old when this happened, or three. Um, so the family was required to provide food, board, clothing, elementary education. In return, the child would work its life for the family until it reached the age of majority. Um, the Children's Aid Society um, had the same expectation. They didn't always use paperwork. This indenture, next slide please. So here's a copy of the, the, the first page fold up. The way this would work is, train would pull into Harleton, Montana. Um, conductor was standing at the door. Um, a nun was standing next to the conductor with the child and this indenture in hand. She'd give the paperwork to the conductor who gave it to the agent who gave it to the father who signed it. Paperwork went back up to the nun. Nun passed the kid and her, su her suitcase down or to the conductor, down to the trainman, and to the new father. And that was the end of the transaction. Generally took less than a minute, literally less than a minute. Um, but the New York Family Hospital generally had an idea who was taking this child. Uh, never did any follow-up, but at least there was some knowledge of where the kid went and at least the name of the family that was supposed to take the child in. Now, what happened with a lot of these kids was both Protestant and Catholic, um, their new family, after a month, didn't want them or the kid didn't want to stay. A lot of them ran away. Um, some of them were moved around in their communities. Um, next slide, please. And this is the last page. And the, the uh, family got a copy of this indenture and the New York Family Hospital had a copy of it in its files as well. And about half the time, we, we find one copy or the other with New York Family kids particularly. Next slide, please. This, so this is really important. Again, I just reiterate that these kids were not adopted. This is a first day photograph of a man and his wife who took in this young boy and he arrived in wherever they were at on this day and there's their photograph. Next slide, please. So one of the things that happened quite often, and this is a, uh, a somewhat typical example. Again, these kids were not taken in to be loved. They were not taken in to be part of the family. They were taken in to work. So in Little Falls, Minnesota, there was a merchant, pretty successful, had a daughter. She was 23 years old and she was blind. So they got a child, a five-year-old girl from the New York Foundling Hospital to serve as the 23-year-old daughter's eyes. So that little girl was up and guiding her 23-year-old person first thing in the morning until the woman went to bed at night. And after six months, actually the local parish priest intervened. They took the child away because she was at the point of utter total exhaustion. But that was not unusual. But again, remember, better to do this than, the, than to die in the streets of New York City. That was kind of the choice of the day. Uh, next slide, please. So at the age of 18, with the New York Foundling Hospital, both boys and girls um, received their 
release. Children's Aid Society, girls at 18, boys at 21. In all cases, they were to, they were to receive on their birthday for boys a new suit of clothes and $100 in cash. And then they were off to the world. For girls, they received a new dress and $75 in cash and off to the world. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but that was the bargain. And the child involved had absolutely nothing to say about the bargain at all. Next slide, please. Again, look at what this young lady is doing on her first day in her new home for her portrait. There's no toy there. She was taken in by a seamstress. And she worked as a seamstress all of her life. A damn good one, by the way, when she was an adult. Next slide, please. So the other thing that happened when these kids got on the train, there was a, um, a postcard or a, a, a pin down their clothes that gave either the train number that they were going to meet at the next station or wherever they had to change train, or the town they were going to. So this young man, he's wearing, and it's actually right here. Um, that is his card. And the first orphan train itinerary that we did was for Renee Rendinger's mother. And she, uh, Renee called me one day, this was like I say in 19, or 2014, and she said, you know, my mother rode an orphan train in 2017, or uh, in 1917, my, my, my mom's still alive. And we have this little card that says um, W83 on it. And she had had that card since she was a little girl. She was three years old when she rode the train. Uh, and she remember, actually remembered most of the train trip, which is amazing, but Sophia was an amazing woman. <coughs> And so she said, Could, do you have any idea what that is? I said, well, yeah, I know, know exactly what it is. I said, that's the train number in Buffalo that Sophia was to change to. She rode a New York Central train from Grand Central Station to Buffalo, New York. And that little note on her pin said W83, which meant West train number 83. So she got on train number 83 going west at Buffalo to Chicago. And that kind of was what precipitated this whole thing as far as the folks in Harleton and we got involved. But at any rate, next slide, please. A lot of boys ran away, especially older boys. Uh, once they found out they were sleeping in the barn and were there to shovel manure. You know, when you're, if you're a savvy street kid off, uh, off streets of New York, that's not gonna work. Some moved from home to home some actually returned to New York City and lived on the streets again. Um, but most did not. Next slide, please. So in 1861, right after the Civil War got underway, there was a uh, uh, Children's Aid Society boy who was 15 named Edward Kelly, and he was placed in uh, Champaign City, Illinois with Mr. Yeager, who was a farmer. And Edward decided he didn't like being a farmer, so he ran away. And Mr. Yeager posted this in the local newspaper, offering a $50 reward for the return of his farm laborer. We have no idea if Edward was returned to Mr. Yeager or not, but nonetheless, uh, that's how these children were viewed, by and large. Next slide, please. Actually, you know, I think we'll take a five-minute potty break. How's that sound? That work? Okay. So some of the people that, uh, and as I said, you know, these kids were not loved generally. They were there to work in their new family situation, uh, and they were generally treated that way. But there were some successes. So the man in the photograph, his name was John Green Brady. And he um, was taken off the streets by Teddy Roosevelt in front of the Roosevelt Mansion in Manhattan. 
Uh, John was taken to the Children's Aid Society, sent to a family in a small town in Indiana. He was raised there. Teddy Roosevelt paid for all of his expenses. And when Mr. Roosevelt became president, Mr. Brady was a young man. Um, Teddy Roosevelt appointed him as the governor of the territory of Alaska. Wow. <laughs> a job he held for a number of years. <laughs> what was his last name, though? Uh, his last name was Brady. John Green Brady was his name. That carried through even though. Yeah, he never, he never took any other name. Um, Another prominent train rider was a guy named Andrew Burke, and he was sent to a family, um, also in Indiana, made his way west, and eventually became the governor of North Dakota. Next slide, next slide, please. You asked earlier about siblings being separated. This is a photograph, new arrivals in Fargo, North Dakota, about 1890. Brother and sister. The brother is the younger, the smaller. Um, and he's wearing a dress because that was normal. They were separated at Fargo, taken by different families. Never saw each other again. Were unable to find each other. And that was the rule and the norm more than the oddity. Uh, quite often, Children who are brothers and sisters were sent west together on the train, but were taken off the train separately and never saw each other again. Next slide, please. Now this young man, he's one of my favorites. Um, he, uh, um, how can I put this? He was taken in by a family in Rock Island, Illinois. His name was Charles Frederick. And he was taken in at age six on a farm. And about three years later, at age nine, he decided he had enough farming. So one evening, he uh, went upstairs. The family was downstairs in the parlor. He went upstairs, wrapped his clothing and goods, whatever he had, in a blanket, threw it out the window. And then he went back downstairs, told his family he was going to the outhouse, went out the door, grabbed his stuff, and split. But interestingly enough, he never left Rock Island and worked in a tanning factory for many, many years. Um, married, had a, a, a family of his own. Next slide, please. This, the young lady in the middle of this picture, um, Edith Peterson is her, is, was her name, and she was adopted, I suppose she looks like maybe she's seven or eight years old. This was her arrival photograph with her new family. Um, they were fairly prosperous people in central Minnesota. Did not want her to inherit anything. Did not adopt her. She became a nun um, and lived until I think she was 96. Next slide, please. So what, are the, what were the railroads part in this whole story? Because none of this could have happened without railroads. Next slide, please. And by the way, this is true today. It's really interesting. So in 1830, a mule or ox team could pull one ton of freight about 10 miles a day. In 1870, a railroad could pull one ton of freight 10 miles in one hour. And that, by the way, was the average speed for a freight train and branch line passenger trains until after World War I, but about 10 miles an hour. It, today, actually this is an older slide, but a railroad can pull one ton of freight over a thousand miles in a day. So there's a freight train, for example, that goes from um, Tri-Cities, Washington, to Kansas City, Missouri on rail link. It's a time to freight. In other words, it's got a schedule. It's the only freight train that goes through Missoula in Helena that has actual schedule. And that train does about 900 miles a day. Um, today, American railroads move one ton of freight 456 miles on one gallon diesel fuel. That is certainly true. 
Railroads today are about four times as efficient as truck in terms of t carrying tonnage. Um, and by the way, when you see railroad locomotives, we call them diesels, but they don't, they're not diesels at all. The diesel engine on a locomotive today is an electric generating plant. That's all it is. The train is actually moved by electric motors that turn the wheels. So there's no transmission, nothing. Um, it's the diesel plant is it generates electricity fed to the motors that move the locomotive and thus pull the train. Um, so today there was a major announcement that the Union Pacific Railroad is opening an inland container depot in Salt Lake City. So they're going to be, Union Pacific is going to be pulling at least four trains a day with containers from Long Beach and Los Angeles to Salt Lake City. Um, and then the containers will be loaded on trucks in Salt Lake for distribution across the country. So every train of containers that move from Los Angeles or Long Beach to Salt Lake, as well as containers from, by rail from Seattle to Chicago through Missoula, every train replaces about 300 trucks on the road. Um, and so it'll, this is all kind of being done on, on the fly, but it'll significantly decrease the congestion at at least those two California ports. But that's why railroads. Next slide, please. This is a photograph of the Pioneer Limited. Now, the Milwaukee Road ran through the heart of Missoula for many years. No smoke and cinders, because it was all electric. But the Pioneer Limited was a Milwaukee Road train between Minneapolis and Chicago. It was an overnight train. And in 90 years of operation, it changed its schedule once. And the reason is because, as I mentioned earlier, the mail moved by rail. And if a railroad decided to change the schedule of the passenger trains, it really rippled across the country and fouled up the mail distribution system. Next slide, please. So in Montana, particularly in the South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Washington, Idaho, the Milwaukee Road carried 40 to 60 percent of all the orphan trained children that came here. And what the Milwaukee did, it provided cheap tickets and car rates to the Children's Aid Society and the New York Foundling Hospital, free passes to the adults, uh, and it, it, it allowed the disruption of its passenger train schedules to accommodate these kids arriving, going on the platform, et cetera, et cetera, because that took 10 or 15 minutes, uh, where the train normally would stop in that town for 30 seconds to a minute. Next slide, please. So the question is, well, why did they do that? Next slide, please. Two things. From a business standpoint, this provided cheap labor to their farm customers. And that was important because the railroads charged hellish freight rates especially for farm commodities. So this was their way of helping the farmers uh, get cheap help. The other thing in terms of this, that particularly the Milwaukee Road did, was for many years, one of the bylaws of the railroad required that all directors lived in New York City. And of course, these kids were overrunning the rich neighborhoods of Manhattan, particularly. And so this was a way to clear the streets in their neighborhoods of these children. Next slide, please. So this, you know, you get, if you're John D. Rockefeller, you get up in the morning, and this is on your front stoop. Uh, not the greatest thing in the world. Next slide, please. Same thing. Next slide, please. So the Milwaukee Road was an early participant. And it's important to remember here that the Milwaukee Road in its day was the most prosperous, profitable railroad in America. And it was owned by William Rockefeller, the brother of John D. Rockefeller. Um, next slide, please. 
So you see, you see this sign on the trails through the middle of Missoula today. Um, and like I say, it was uh, a big deal. And the reasons for supporting the Orphan Train saga by this railroad and others um, was not from the goodness of anybody's heart. And by the way, the Milwaukee Road in its day from Seattle to Chicago and on to Louisville, Kentucky was the only transcontinental railroad in the Northwest. There were only two transcontinental railroads in the United States at the time. Uh, one was the Southern Pacific, which ran from Los Angeles to New Orleans, and the Milwaukee Road, which ran from Seattle to Louisville, Kentucky through Chicago. The Union Pacific Railroad ended at Omaha, Nebraska. The Northern Pacific Railroad ended in, eventually at St. Paul, as did the Great Northern. So if you rode a, a Northern Pacific train from Missoula, and there were four trains a day, even as late as 1967, um, you got to St. Paul, you had to change to a Burlington route train uh, to, to continue on to Chicago. Next slide, please. So here's an ad in the Fort Dodge, Iowa Messenger from 1886. Um, and uh, these kids, important here, it says, second sentence, these children have been provided with home at Epworth, Farley, Dyersville, Nuvian, and Luxembourg. And the last of the children will be taken care of in Fort Dodge. So they knew where these children were gonna go before they got on the train to New York. And by the way, what the New York Family Home did, the other thing they did is they had a form letter for many, many years. Um, and basically the form letter was sent from New York to the prospective family, parents, and it said, be at the train station at Fort Dodge at 3.45 p.m. on Tuesday, September 5th, 1906, to pick up your child. And if you're late, the train is gonna leave without you. You won't get the kid. Next slide, please. So a conservative number is 40,000 of these children rode the Milwaukee Road at least 40% of all the kids throughout the Midwest and the West, and that includes Nebraska and Kansas, et cetera. The Northern Pacific and the Great Northern Railroad were also somewhat participants, but nothing like the Milwaukee Road was. Um, next slide, please. And by the way, the first railroad to come into Montana was the Union Pacific from Ogden, Idaho. Came over Manita Pass. That was the first railroad into Montana to Butte not the Northern Pacific or the Great Northern. This is a Norman Rockwell painting from about 1928. Um, from, it was a cover on the Saturday Evening Post and it shows the nun with a child or two, the prospective mother. From a railroad standpoint, if you look at this gentleman right here, he's looking at his clock. He's saying, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Next slide, please. So the Milwaukee Road, as I said, required board members to live in New York. And part of this whole deal was to keep these kids out of their neighborhoods. Um, so the Milwaukee Road did several things to help with that. Next slide, please. The Milwaukee Road, although it didn't go to New York, had a company ticket office in New York. Um, most Western Railroads had contract offices, but the Milwaukee had an actual ticket office with Milwaukee employees. So they were empowered to sell tickets at a discounted price, issue passes to the adults traveling with these children. Um, uh, ergo, the Milwaukee became a heavy involver in this program. Next slide, please. So here we have um, a group of boys in New York City getting ready to leave, heading west. They had no idea where they were going or what they were going to, but they were going. Next slide, please. Particularly in the Milwaukee, the other thing that was interesting for all the railroads with these kids, the Children's Aid Society over the years preferred the Erie Railroad. The Erie Railroad ran from New York to Chicago. It didn't go through any major city in between. It ran about 150 miles south of Lake Erie. It was a freight railroad. So their passenger trains were second class but the tickets were cheap. Um, the New York Foundling Hospital preferred 
the uh, New York Central Railroad. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the Rockefeller involvement. The New York Central Railroad until 1910 was the only railroad in New York City that had a station in Manhattan. No other railroad had a railroad station or depot in Manhattan. And the New York Central Station was Grand Central Station. Uh, and so the New York Central ran on the north or uh, east side of the Hudson River up to Albany, where it crossed and went to Buffalo. All the other railroads, including the Erie, um, had pier docks on the Hudson River, on the, on the lower Manhattan side. So if you were gonna take a, Pens a Pennsylvania Railroad train or an Erie Railroad train or a Baltimore and Ohio train west from New York, you went down to the pier, bought your ticket, and then a railroad ferry would take you across the river to a terminal where you could then indoors, actually get out of the ferry, get on your train, and the train would go west. Um, so, and all the passenger schedules uh, reflect that. It's really interesting. And some of them, like the Pennsylvania Railroad, the, uh, the Erie Railroad was uh, Pavona Place, huge. Pennsylvania, on the, this is on the Jersey City side, was um, called Exchange Place, massive. But uh, the Penn Central finally b dug the t their tunnel under the river into Manhattan and they opened Penn Station in 1910 which is now Amtrak's main station in New York City. Although Grand Central Station handles more passengers every day than any other station in the country. It's a commuter station. But the Milwaukee uh, had a schedule from Chicago West that fit really well. So from New York to Chicago, these kids would travel at night. It was too difficult to get a group of kids up, bathed, dressed, fed into a pier or to, to Grand Central Station to catch a seven o'clock in the morning train. It was just not gonna happen. And not only that, if you got on the train at seven in the morning in New York, you would end up in Chicago in the middle of the night, 30 hours later. So most of these kids would get on a train at noon or two o'clock it was an overnight train to Chicago. It would get in about noon or two o'clock or four o'clock, depending on the train. And then they would change stations quite often because there were, every railroad had its own station, uh, except a couple. And get on the train at say seven or eight, seven o'clock, six o'clock in the evening in Chicago and arrive in Missoula a day and a half later. But they were traveling at night primarily. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a Children's Aid Society group of children. Uh, this photograph is taken the day that they are leaving. And there is one adult in this group that went with them, and that's her right there. Next slide, please. So Sophia Kaminsky, whose daughter Renee wrote, the, without question, the best nonfiction book about this whole story, uh, it was actually LW83 that was pinned to her coat, which means Line West 83 in 1917. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is uh, a tag that a child had on that was dropped off at uh, Glen Ullam, North Dakota. This is a, a New York Foundling Hospital child, and uh, you see the receipt number is 15. So the parents had a receipt along with that letter that said be at the station, and it had a number on it, and then that child was wearing that tag so that if they matched, then the, the nun gave the child to the parents. Next slide, please. So this is the letter I was talking about um, that the New York Foundlings sent before the child left. We take pleasure in notifying you that the little boy which you so kindly ordered will arrive at time, date, and place. Next slide, please. So this is Sophia's trip. And she went from New York City to Buffalo. She got on actually Michigan Central Railway train number 83 
to Cleveland, where she stayed overnight, then to Chicago, where she stayed overnight in a car, train car, in the drill yard, and then on to Minneapolis, and then to Springfield, Minnesota. Um, and this journey took five days, by the way. Most of these kids traveled much faster than that, but because of the uh, train number 83 in the Michigan Central, we know that her trip was arduous and long, and she was three years old. Next slide, please. So here they are, dressed and ready to rock and roll. God only knows what happened to them. Uh, we certainly don't. Next slide, please. The other railroad, by the way, that operated in Montana for many, many years and is still here, in a sense, is the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. How many of you have heard of the Burlington route? It went from Chicago to Denver up to Billings. Um, there it terminated, and it was owned by James Hill, who also owned the Great Northern and later the Northern Pacific. But, so if you, if you wanted to go to Denver, or point south towards Chicago from Great Falls, you'd get on a Great Northern train that went to Billings, and then you'd switch to a Burlington route train, that's what the railroad is called, and down you'd go. Uh, and that line still operates, goes through Wheatland County, not through Harlington, but through the county. Next slide, please. This is one of the most interesting photographs of all, in our humble opinion. Many years ago, Someone gave this photograph to the Kansas State Historical Society, and one of their curators put a caption on it that says, this may be an orphan train, picture of an orphan train. So it has been adopted as the, as the iconic image of the orphan train movement. In fact, Renee's book has a cover, on the cover has this photograph. Actually, it has nothing to do with orphan trains at all. It is an Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe work train that has just come into a new small town where there has not yet been built a water tower for the, for the engine. So if you look at this, I'm gonna go on this side and be a little easier, I think. And this is a photograph of the townspeople, a lot of the kids uh, getting their photographs taken with the brand new train that just pulled into town for the first time. So we got an engine, we got a tender, here we got a wooden, big, huge barrel and that's full of water for the locomotive because there's no water tower in the town to fill it. Next we have a boxcar for supplies for building the railroad. Next we have a cook car, and not in this photograph, but behind that is, um, even for its day, an old um, passenger car where the workers stayed. But when you see this photograph, uh, it not, has nothing to do with orphan trains at all, but nonetheless, it has become the symbol of the orphan train movement in America. <laughs> Next slide, please. So this ended abruptly. In 1929, there was by then in place a fairly good social service system in New York City, particularly. So the legislature banned the movement of orphans out of the state of New York. And that's how the orphan train movement in the United States ended. Like I say, what the British had ended in Canada in 1953. Next slide, please. So here are some genealogy tips if you're into finding these kids. New York was and is a closed adoption state. Uh, which means there are, what we do when we deal with families and help them find their, 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 the history of their ancestor and their train trip, um, it's all very confidential. So as, as you notice tonight, I didn't tell you the names <coughs> of any of these children except for Alice. Um, so when we deal with the Children's Aid Society in the New York Foundling Hospital, if you call them or text them, or email them, you will be severely rebuffed because they cannot respond to that kind of inquiry. They just simply legally cannot. You have to write them a letter. And got to include a photo ID, proof that you're a direct descendant, 
Uh, and that's a family tree. That's you know a detailed description of how great grandma and I were related, or, or mom and I were related. Uh, Twenty-five dollar research fee. Then all the history in terms of facts and family lore and fiction that you know about that person's early life. And then if you have any documents like marriage certificates, death certificates, obituaries, um, news stories about orphans arriving in Elmville, North Dakota, et cetera, um, they go with it. And we help people write, prepare those letters and we don't charge anything for what we do. Uh, next slide, please. So the other thing that's important is in the census information particularly, uh, these children are never listed as sons or daughters. Um, so if you look in a, a census document for Missoula County, it'll say John Johnson father, Anita Johnson mother, Michael Johnson son, uh, Sarah Johnson daughter, uh, Joe Johnson border or laborer. That's a, in particularly in Montana, that's about an 80, 80 to 85% guarantee that he was, in fact, an orphan train rider. So that's how we are pretty successful in finding these kids. But um, so some of the, the other thing then, in terms of genealogy searches that are important with these children, very, very few of them had birth certificates. They just didn't. They had baptismal certificates because both the New York Founding Hospital and the Children's Aid Society made sure these children were baptized before they left New York. However, a baptismal certificate, however interesting, is not a legal document. So they had no birth certificates. Very, very few had adoption uh, papers. So later in life, uh, particularly for the children that were born after 1900 and sent west, um, this wrecked havoc with them. Because most states required that you present a, a, a birth certificate in order to get a marriage license. These kids, as young adults, could not do that. Um, military inscription, much, le much less volunteering for the military. Same thing. Social security payments, Medicare payments, uh, all those things that we do in our lives that are important requires a copy of a birth certificate or, or an adoption document. They had none. And that is one of the reasons, <coughs> excuse me, I think that so many of these children never spoke of their childhood uh, with their families, uh, husbands, wives, sons, daughters, nieces, nephews, etc. And quite often, even at the end of their life, um, the death certificates were not considered complete because there was no birth certificate to show that the child had ever been born. Next slide, please. So as I say, um, we sell these books at Renee's cost. If you're interested, I'd love to sell you one, 25 bucks. Um, and <laughs> The iconic photo on the top, of course, as they say, has <laughs> nothing to do with the orphan train story at all. But it is true that most of the boys, particularly in New York, that were taken away, that's what they did. They sold newspapers. Um, they stole from grocers, thieved whenever they could. Uh, next slide, please. So this is kind of what we do. Now, if you're interested in a copy of this presentation, I'd be happy to provide it. Um, my email address is in your materials. Um, if you want it, uh, there are a couple of things. Nothing in here is copyrighted. That's on purpose. Copyright protection is long run. There's no audio with it. Um, if you want me to present it, I'd be happy to do that. But um, we also have a slide-by-slide -slide speaker's guide, which comes with it. Um, so you can just email me or Drop me a line. Next slide, please. And as I say, we are the Upper Muscle Shell Historic Society in Harleton. <coughs> and we put this together a few years ago. Morrison Merrily, which is the largest civil engineering firm in Montana, 
have been very supportive and helpful in putting together this project. So I think that's about the last slide, Nick, isn't it? Oh, yes, remember always, this is important. <laughs> we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We're borrowing it from our kids and our grandkids and our grandkids. So since we're talking about children, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Next slide, please. That's it. Thank you all very much. If you have any questions, now is the time. Yes, sir. I can see where they could go and pick up the little kids off the street. What about the older boys? How did they handle getting them onto the trains if they really didn't want to go? Everybody hear the question? OK. Um, well, you've got to remember the police were involved in this constantly. Um, and you know, if, if you're eight years old and you're on the streets and you're hungry, you'll do just about anything to eat. And I think that was a lot of the motivation. Uh, but again, a lot of the boys, especially older boys, they, they go, they'd go on the trip, and within three months they were gone. They either ran away, went somewhere else in the area, or who knows what happened. I mean, these children just sort of melded into the fabric of America. It's like the guys that built the St. Paul Tunnel. When it was done, they just sort of disappeared. And then did they um, just not go through the big cities so that the children didn't wind up on their streets as well? That's right. That's why the whole idea behind this mission was to send children to farms in small towns. Uh, the, the only large city in America where these children, some of them ended up was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That was through the auspices of the New York Foundling Hospital. There was a parish priest in South Milwaukee that started a number of parishes there. Now this was not in the city, this is in the suburbs to the south and west of the city, which, you know, 20 miles away. Um, but he was very active in getting his parishioners to take these children. But that's about as close as they came. Uh, Children's Aid Society, they would send children to St. Louis, but again, they didn't stay in St. Louis, they were in the suburbs 20, 30, 40, 50 miles away. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I stopped at the Orphan Train Museum in Foxboria, Kansas. Yep, we worked very closely with them. And they did say that even there, sometimes they were able to trace uh, siblings later on. Yes, and in fact, uh, um, sometimes God provides an accident. So, two years ago, last July, two years ago last July, we got a request from a gal who lives in Ohio looking for her mother and how her mother got from New York to actually Illinois. And so we were able to put that itinerary together. About six weeks later, we got a request from a gal who lives in Illinois asking the same questions about her mother. So we put her itinerary together. And as I was proofing that one, I realized these children <coughs> had been on the same train back in 1887 or I can't remember the year. Um, so I got a hold of uh, the gal at the New York Family Hospital and I said, hey, Jennifer, we got these two girls on the same train from New York, same date, same location. She checked her records and she says, yes, they're sisters. Oh. Well, neither family knew So I'm thinking, about a month after I wrote to each of these women that we had <laughs> found her aunt, they had a big family reunion in Springfield, Illinois. But the two families had never heard of each other. But so, yes, that, that does happen occasionally, thankfully. Yes, sir. On uh, PBS, we're talking about 2021 now. PBS, there's a guy that interviews 
very famous people and through both written records and blood sample mm -hmm. analysis, they discovered that they had relatives back in Czechoslovakia in 1462. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how the blood sample itself creates this. I, I, ha I have a feeling that one of the people in this room and I share a relative that dates back to 1323 in some place in Europe. You're, yeah, and you're talking about finding your roots with Robert Gates. Yeah, yeah. yeah. finding your roots. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yes? I was going to ask about the DNA um, of grandchildren and things of these uh, people. Who well, there, we, uh, how do you use it? the last probably three or four years, um, it has helped narrow down, uh, but like somebody will send me an email. We, and by the way, you reach us through email only. We don't have a website. We work through the National Orphan Train Museum. Um, so we, uh, that enters into probably about half of what the requests that we have. Um, and it's helpful, but it's not conclusive for us because uh, our record base, well, we have two of them. We have about 50,000 pages of railroad timetables and guides that we work with to block trips. Then we also work with the database foundations at the New York Family Hospital and the Children's Aid Society in New York. Um, and so for our focus, that is adequate. Uh, like I say, occasionally we have been able to put families together just through that. Um, both the New York Family Hospital and Children's Aid Society will use DNA that a family member may have um, to check their DNA databases. Um, but again, there's 350,000 of these kids and um, it, it's just a, kind of a hit and miss. Yeah. Follow up? I was wondering if they were able to somehow connect up also with their original parents. Uh, generally, no, because the original parents are unknown. They, you know, it, it, it's like if you're an Irish immigrant and your your father your, came to Missoula as a little boy. Yes, you can check your DNA and it'll probably tell you where he came from in Ireland. Um, so in that sense, it's very helpful. But it's not something that the orphan train community gets involved in per se. Um, the New York Family Hospital, the Children's Aid Society, provide access to their database as a service. They do not do independent work at all. It just is too cost prohibitive. They would rather put their money and resources into children in New York today. It's... More questions? Yes. Um, you, you listed a lot of things that you have to, to provide them to help trace their family. Is any of that information being attached to that, that person's name when, it, when the, the link is made so that someday in the future if another child is um, looking for the same thing, then they'll know that this other family exists? Well, in the, both the New York Family Hospital and the Children's Aid Society have digitized all of these records. Okay. Um, you know, in 1853, the Children's Aid Society record consisted of a name of a child, made up or real, left New York on this and this, such and such a date, destination, two dot Montana. That was it. By 1928 or 27 or 26, there was more information kept, but there were, there's not you know, 50 pages of information on every child that was sent west. They well, just, not on the child, but the person searching for that child. If that link is made, is that person's information there as well? No, the, the, only, thing, the only thing that, like the Children's Aid Society, New York Family Hospital will do is if you make a request to either agency or the New York Juvenile Asylum, for example, they will check their database to see what it, if they have any matches for the information required. That's all they do. They don't keep 
anything. They, they don't keep your records, nothing. And then, do we have any idea how many orphans came to Montana? How many orphans came to Montana? Wow. Um, well, there have been two studies done of the migration of these kids. One by a graduate student at Creighton University in, in Omaha, and one by a graduate student at uh, the University of Wisconsin at Marquette. And looking at those, plus our own experience, we've done, I don't know, 700 of these letters, I suppose. Um, you know, and you do enough, you get a pattern. Mm -hmm. So I would say, if I were going to guess, I would say maybe 40,000 of these kids over the years came to Montana. A lot of them came after 1910 because the Milwaukee uh, Western Extension opened in 1909. That's, and a so, of, that's a lot of kids. It is. And, you know, you can, so you look at the Milwaukee Road through Montana and its branch lines, particularly in, in northern Montana, uh, like to Roy and Aguam. Anybody ever heard of Aguam, Montana? <laughs> It's north of Great Falls. It was the end of the line from the Milwaukee Road back in the day, up in that part of the world. Um, and the Great Northern and the Northern Pacific. Now, the Northern Pacific had very few branch lines. The Great Northern had more. But those towns were touched significantly by the orphan trade movement. No doubt about it. I, Just, do, I do a lot of genealogy, and I have not found any. Isn't that odd? Yeah. Well, like I say, look for laborers and borders. Okay. Um, you know. Um, and yeah, I mean the other the other these kids came to Montana like houses did. You know, in Harleton, over a third of the homes came to Harleton as kits on the railroad from Chicago, ordered out of Montgomery Ward and Sears and Roebuck. And there are a lot of houses in Missoula that came here the same way. All these. Uh, any more questions or thoughts? Nineteen ten, forty thousand people came to Montana on the Milwaukee Road orphans. Yeah. Who paid their fares? Well, uh, first of all, not all those kids came on the Milwaukee Road. They came earlier on the Northern Pacific and Great Northern. It's just the Milwaukee handled a big chunk of them over the years. Who paid the tab? Well, um, the New York Family Hospital, Children's Aid Society, like I say, with the railroads, the railroads give them free passes, reduced ticket prices. They raised the money from the wealthy in New York to buy the tickets. And as I pointed out with the directors of the Milwaukee Road, these people were more than happy to put out a few bucks to get these waifs out of their neighborhood. You know? It was... So if you say a few bucks, yeah, but can you specify how much money? Well, in 1910, Milt, maybe help me here, but I think uh, a ticket from New York City to Missoula might have been $4, $5. In 1967, if you rode the North Coast Limited from Chicago to Missoula, you had to pay a dollar fifty cent premium for your ticket. Anybody else? Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it very much. Mm -hmm.